Hello all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another amazing 10. Due to the proximity of Halloween, I'll be going with 10 spooky attractions this time. This list includes 7 places that continue to be open as of 2021 and 3 that all closed many years ago. Enjoy! Spooky attraction number 1, Spook Hill. I suppose it's rather obvious that a video covering 10 of Florida's spooky attractions would include Spook Hill. Located in the city of Lake Wales, Spook Hill is Florida's most unlikely tourist attraction, yet it's been popular for many decades. Curiously, this famous tourist site isn't even a wide spot on the road, yet thousands visit it each year. It sits directly outside Spook Hill Elementary School, perhaps the only school in the world named after such a phenomenon, and it's only a few blocks from the entrance to Bach Tower Gardens. In reality, Spook Hill itself isn't all that spooky. When visiting, there's a large sign on the side of the road explaining how you roll uphill in your car. I have no intention of spoiling your fun, so I'll leave it at that. What is spooky is the legend of Spook Hill. The bewildering tale of how Spook Hill came to be has morphed over the years and includes a rotating cast of peculiar characters. I should say that the legend, as currently told on the sign, has been cleaned up over the years, but in the past there were elements that would be considered inappropriate today. The list of individuals in the stories includes a stereotypical Indian chief, a terrified black angler, and the ghost of a pirate sometimes listed as Captain Sasparula, and sometimes listed as the famous, yet all too fictional, Tampa Bay pirate Jose Gaspar. He is otherwise famous as the namesake of the massive Gasparilla Festival. Oh, and there's also a giant angry man-eating gator. Some locals still consider the place haunted by the ghosts of at least one of these characters. It's unknown when the first person discovered the phenomenon, but it's an odd and spooky attraction in which sits in the midst of the Lake Wales Ridge, the highest points of land in the peninsular Florida. The area was a string of islands between two and three million years ago when the rest of Florida was underwater. So think of that. Spook Hill is one of the oldest places in the state. By the way, Spook Hill Elementary's mascot is Casper the Friendly Ghost. That's pretty awesome in itself. I've always thought they should have a festival each year called Casparilla. Spooky Attraction Number 2 Devil's Mill Hopper Geological State Park Yet another obvious site to add to the list of spooky attractions is Devil's Mill Hopper, a state park opened in 1974 and located northwest of Gainesville. It's the location of one of Florida's largest dry sinkholes. 120 feet or 37 meters deep, and over 500 feet or 152 meters in diameter, the sinkhole has 12 springs feeding the small pool at the bottom. The pool empties out through further crevices in the ground, which is why the sinkhole hasn't become yet another lake. Like all Florida sinkholes, the Devil's Mill Hopper was formed when the limestone bedrock was eroded by surface water. As a consequence, the walls of the sinkhole provide a long geological record. There are three distinct environments in the park. On the surface, surrounding the sinkhole, there are higher areas of sandy soil and pine tree forests that are scrubland. There are also broad areas of hammock, with oaks being the predominant tree. The lowest areas are swamp. The sinkhole itself is a unique environment altogether. In summer, it can be 20 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than at the surface. 236 steps follow a wooden path to the bottom, where there's an observation platform. Visitors are generally not allowed to walk on the floor in order to protect the delicate land. It was likely known by local indigenous people for thousands of years, and it was first documented by white settlers as early as the 1830s. At some point, locals descended to the bottom and discovered a number of scattered bones. This helped create the legend that persists today, that the sinkhole is so deep that it was an entrance to the underworld. The story goes that it was created by the devil to trap the expected rescuers of a kidnapped maiden. The bones were considered to be that of animals and people who had been tricked and gone to the devil. The second part of the name might even have a darker meaning. 
It comes from the sinkhole's similar appearance to the hopper of a grist mill, the part that funnels the grain onto the millstone where it will get ground into flour, an apt analogy to souls entering hell. In reality, the descent to the bottom is one of the most delightful journeys in Florida. Vegetation grows out of the wall of the sinkhole, so you're continually surrounded by greenery, and you can see down towards the bottom as you walk. At the base, you're in another world. It's likely to be a different temperature than the surface, and sounds are muted, mostly a bit of water sounds, plus there are places to sit to absorb the peaceful scene. Welcome to one of the entrances to Florida's underworld. Spooky attraction number three, Mystery House. Once located across from the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, the Mystery House was an odd attraction on Anastasia Island, the barrier island that protects the nation's oldest city, St. Augustine. Created by Al Mosier, the attraction was housed rather remarkably in what appeared to be a standard home. It had a collection of fairly common optical illusions and lasted for about 20 years in the 1950s through the mid-1970s. Mosher promoted the Mystery House as being contrary to natural laws, writing, Some astonished visitors claim that they have been magnetized by the pull of the North and South Poles. Others suspect that an atomic reaction has taken place. And it's where the law of gravitation appears to have gone haywire. In reality, the Mystery House used effects such as forced perspective, distortion, weird angles, and more to create an attraction that did its best to confuse and entertain visitors. One of the Mystery House's brochures, or really just a flyer that's in the archive, is this one. It simply has a large question mark on the back side. Now that's a bold statement. In this rare postcard, postmark 1957, you can note that the image of Al Mosher and three guests is the same one used on the brochures. Of interest are the pictures on the wall in the background. The central one is a nod to the Mystery House's neighbor, the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, as the image can be seen on some of the Gator Park's brochures and postcards. The other two pictures don't appear in the brochures. Maybe this was yet another effect of the Mystery House. Spooky attraction number four, Medieval Torture Museum. To be honest, the word spooky isn't exactly how I'd describe one of St. Augustine's newer attractions. Seeing as it's the first museum I've ever visited that was solely dedicated to the history of torture, I'd suggest far more dramatic and florid adjectives to describe the Medieval Torture Museum located on St. George Street in the historic district. Intense, unsettling. And for some visitors, after about 30 minutes into exploring the many rooms, overwhelming. The museum is filled with dozens of devices, most accompanied by gut-wrenching stories of cruelty and pain. Room after room, making up about 4,000 square feet or 372 square meters of really scary stuff. The museum opened in 2017 and it has one of the largest collections of torture devices available to the public. Much that's on display is replicas, not that it matters much. Not surprisingly, the presentation is rather dramatic with subdued lighting, special effects, sound, and even an occasional sign encouraging visitors to get involved as an oppressor or a victim. It's not hokey, however. The team that designed it did a good job. And yes, this sounds like a review. However, there's little history to relate about the museum itself. That being said, it's definitely one of the more interesting attractions in the state and deserves to be better known. Spooky attraction number five, the London Wax Museum. In the 1960s and 70s, St. Petersburg and its beaches became one of the tourism hotspots in the state. With attractions such as the replica of the HMS Bounty and the Aquatarium, one of the state's oceanariums I covered in an earlier video, the area was building on its history as a laid-back vacation destination. In 1963, a wax museum opened on Gulf Boulevard in St. Petersburg Beach, and it would become a fixture for about 25 years. It was originally known as the London Wax Museum, a nod to Madame Tussaud's famous wax figure attraction that had been in operation in London, England since 1835. 
developed by Alec Rigby, who was a franchisee for both Tussauds and the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museums. The attraction opened with nearly 100 wax figures. Those figures came from London, actually from Josephine Tussaud's work, a great-granddaughter of Madame Tussaud, whose first name was Marie, by the way. Because of Rigby's franchise rights, he was allowed to associate Josephine's name to the museum. Around 1969, Rigby ended up purchasing the Ripley's Believe It or Not company, and the London Wax Museum would stop using Josephine's name and begin using the name of Louis Tussaud. Not to get too much into the weeds here, but Rigby purchased the rights to Lewis's name, though Lewis was long dead. And yes, he was another of Madame Maria's great-grandchildren. In 1978, Rigby and the Ripley Company would sell the museum to its general manager and local, Ted Stombaugh. Stombaugh would see the museum through its last decade, when the attraction struggled to be a success, and would eventually close. Now to get to the reason it makes this list of spooky attractions. The museum had upwards of 125 famous figures on display. Like many wax museums, they were grouped into theme sections such as politics, sports, and entertainment. One of the more popular sections was the Chamber of Horrors. Described as being only recommended for interested adults, the Chamber of Horrors showed the dark side of humanity as can be seen on these pages from a souvenir guide from the attraction's early years. The rogues gallery included Ivan the Terrible, Ruby shooting Oswald, Marie Antoinette's execution, The Rack, Frankenstein's monster, The Wolfman, and the ever-popular Plague. While the Chamber of Horrors was also a regular feature in other wax museums, the London Wax Museum had a more extensive focus on the perverse and sinister. For example, it also featured a rather involved scene covering Chicago mobs of the 1920s. A pirate's tavern featuring the all-too-real black beard and the previously discussed legendary Jose Gaspar. Finally, we reach a tableau of the leaders of the Confederacy. Horrendous, indeed. The London Wax Museum was opened until 1989 when its building was demolished and its collection sold off, part of it being added to the collection of Potter's Wax Museum in St. Augustine, which is still in operation today. Spooky Attraction Number 6, Coral Castle Long before Walt Disney World was built, the Coral Castle was thought by many of its visitors as the most magical attraction in Florida. This remarkable place was created by Edward Leedskelnin, an immigrant from Latvia. Leedskelnin began building his home in Florida City around 1923. He built the entire place by himself, even though it meant quarrying huge stones, as well as moving and shaping them by hand. In doing so, he created tremendous statues and imposing scenes that continued to impress tourists nearly 100 years later. Magic was claimed to be part of the process, even by Leedskelnin himself. Still, to this day, there remains questions about how it was accomplished. Of course, this might be all explained by, Give me a place to stand on and I will move the earth. The quote attributed, probably wrongly, to the ancient Greek inventor Archimedes in describing the usefulness of leverage. Coral Castle was originally referred to as Ed's Place. Later, when he moved to nearby Homestead, a job that took three years, he called the place Rock Gate after the massive gate of rock that he built as part of his own. It's uncertain as to whether he created the structure as a tourist attraction or not, but from the beginning he seems to have been happy to receive visitors. He would ask for a dime and later a quarter when visitors dropped by. Leedskelnin often said his reason for building the interesting place was that it was for his sweet sixteen. The story goes that the young lady rejected him before he immigrated to the U.S. The truth of this story is unclear, as Leedskalnin himself described it in his autobiography as more of an ideal than referring to an actual event. Still, after his death in 1951, the Coral Castle's promotional materials focused on the lost love angle using ad copies such as Created for the Love of a Woman. Between the lost love angle and the compelling mystery of the manner of construction, the Coral Castle certainly falls within the realm of spooky. 
The attraction has been featured regularly for over 50 years in any media that explores mystical construction methods, and attempts have been made to connect it with magic, ley lines, alien technology, and long-lost ancient building techniques. In 1984, the site was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. The modern name of Coral Castle is, in reality, a bit of a misnomer. The structure is built of oolite, a form of limestone comprised of ancient fossilized shells and coral, and is at least 75,000 years old. The stones can be called modern megaliths, and are similar in size and weight to those in Stonehenge and the blocks that made up the Egyptian pyramids. Once he was in Homestead, he used part of his property as a quarry, which allowed him to do most of his work hidden from the public. It's estimated that the rock used in the construction had a combined weight of about a thousand U.S. tons, or over 900 metric tons. It's a walled compound with a tower that housed his living quarters. In the grounds, there are many stone sculptures, including representations of the planets, a Florida-shaped table, a heart-shaped table, rock rocking chairs, a barbecue, bathtub, and even a working sundial. There are no definitive answers about how one five-foot-tall person was able to do the work. However, the hand tools he had available could have built the puzzling structure. The process would have been difficult for one person, but wasn't impossible. The Coral Castle continues to be a popular attraction and is a testament to what one person can accomplish in a lifetime. Spooky Attraction Number 7 Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights as of 2021, there are three Florida theme parks that have scary Halloween events. Busch Gardens has been hosting theirs since 1999, when it started out as Spooky Safari. By the next year, they settled on the annual event's permanent name, Hallow Scream. The highly successful event has grown into one of the most popular events held by Busch Gardens. In 2021, SeaWorld, Busch Gardens' sister park, has added their own Hallow Scream event in conjunction with their kid-friendly and candy-focused Spooktacular. Both Bush Garden and SeaWorld's events have haunted houses and scare zones. For the uninitiated, haunted houses, or today simply houses, are enclosed areas with detailed storylines and highly themed decor. The visitors follow a maze-like path with special effects and performers doing their best to scare them. Scare zones are also themed, but are outdoors, usually along the park's main pathways. They also have special effects and performers. While the events of Bush Gardens and SeaWorld are quite successful, the originator of theme park scary Halloween events is Universal Studios Florida. The park opened in 1991 and its first Halloween event occurred the same year. Known as Fright Nights, the three-night event featured only one house. Like Bush Gardens, Universal's annual Halloween event would get its permanent name in its second year, Halloween Horror Nights. Eventually, it would be the most successful Halloween-themed event in the country, with the largest annual attendance and highest profitability. Since the nighttime event is included in the regular admission price, the tremendous ticket sales, as well as merchandise, food, and alcohol, constitute a significant percentage of Universal's profits every year. More commonly known to its fans as HHN, the event is about as extreme as theme parks will ever get. Throughout each house and scare zone, visitors are regularly bombarded with intense lighting effects and crazed characters, as well as sound effects and music at a volume that requires the performers to wear hearing protection. By the way, those performers are officially called scare actors, and those that work in houses typically hide in boo holes until they perform their scare. There's usually scare actors with live chainsaws and even ones on stilts. For many years, there has been a dedicated team that works year-round to come up with all the ideas and designs for each HHN. Considering that Universal Studios made its name with moving monsters such as Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy, and Frankenstein's monster, it shouldn't be a surprise that HHN has used both their classic monsters as well as dozens of other film and TV characters to flesh out their houses and scare zones. The event is so successful that Universal has been able to partner with some of the biggest horror hits from Hollywood, including The Walking Dead, Halloween, Psycho, Ghostbusters, The Purge, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and The Thing. 
Those are supplemented with original Universal stories, including some that have returned, essentially as a sequel, in future years. Anyone who's a true fan should be able to tell you all about the village of Shadybrook, for instance. While the event is safe, the very nature of HHN means that there's a large security presence. Darkness, alcohol, disorientation, and the subject matter of extreme violence means every year there are attendees who get into a load of trouble and the house they end up visiting is the Orange County Jail. Sometimes it's scare actors that get hurt, but over the 30 years, the event has had an excellent safety record. Usually the biggest worry is, if a scare actor has a bad enough injury, the hospital needs to understand that most of the blood and guts covering the patient is merely makeup. Spooky Attraction Number 8, Atomic Tunnel One of Florida's most peculiar attractions was located near Daytona Beach in the 1950s and 60s. Located in Port Orange, little definitive information on the attraction is available. W.R. Johnston is said to have built the structure primarily as a shop to sell orchids and other plants, which were on display throughout the building. It was located on U.S. Route 1, the primary road from the state of Maine south to Key West along the eastern seaboard. Atomic Tunnel was sometimes described as a bomb shelter. This misinterpretation likely comes from the dramatic name of the attraction for part of its existence. The beautiful Atomic Tunnel gives the impression that it might have been underground and possibly bomb-proof. However, it's clear that neither was true. The above-ground structure appeared to be curving, narrow, and rounded. Comprised mostly of concrete, it had an unusually organic feel as it was pierced by dozens of small, irregularly shaped windows, which partly illuminated the interior. There seemed to have been more than one larger room between sections of the tunnel as well. Its overall length is unclear, but considering the description of what visitors could see and experience, it must have been fairly long. Speculation suggests somewhere around 100 to 150 feet of tunnel. The cross-section of the tunnel was generally circular with walls 10 feet or about 3 meters apart. The attraction operated for several years in the 1950s and 60s. A postcard for the attraction was postmarked 1963, so it was operating at least until then. The brochures have a list of sites, including a bird room, an orchid room, and various fish, including piranha. There was also a patio which had even more animals and more plants. Obviously, the person in charge of promotion for the atomic tunnel felt that Happy, the walking catfish, was the thing that would encourage visitors to come, hence his starring role in the brochures. The species most commonly called a walking catfish is Clarius batracus. Native to the Indonesian island of Java, the unusual fish can walk in a fashion. Living in swampy areas, the fish evolved long ago to be able to leave one dried up pool to head to another by slithering along. Like several other fish, including the popular betta fish, walking catfish have a partly modified gill structure containing a labyrinth organ, which allows them to both collect the oxygen saturated in water as well as extract it directly from the air. Today, the walking catfish is considered an invasive species in Florida, coming to the state as early as the 1950s. Atomic Tunnel's happy was likely related to some of the walking catfish that had been released into Florida waters. Considering the attraction was located in a curious structure and remarkably named Atomic Tunnel, I believe it fits on the list of Florida's spooky attractions. Spooky Attraction Number 9, Ripley's Believe It or Not Robert Ripley was the world's most famous cartoonist in the mid-20th century. Mr. Believe It or Not produced cartoons, took well-publicized trips around the world, appeared in radio, TV, and cinematic shows, and published books. His fame equaled that of any politician or movie star in the 1930s and 40s. His rise to fame began simply enough with a daily cartoon that premiered in 1929, where he would share strange facts about the world. He titled it, Believe It or Not. While the information shared was often hard to believe, it was typically true. While Ripley was the face of what would become an extensive industry of odd information, he employed a diverse and numerous team of researchers. It seemed inevitable that Ripley would look into creating a museum that would showcase the bizarre things he collected on his many trips. 
This he did in 1933 at the Chicago World's Fair. The auditorium, as it was named, was a success and was repeated at other fairs. By 1949, his company moved towards opening the first permanent museum. This is when St. Augustine entered the picture. The new museum of the weird would be placed in an appropriate building known as Castle Warden. With its fanciful Moorish revival style, the castle was one of the earliest mansions built in the old city. Built in 1887 as a winter home for William Warden, the castle quickly became a center of cultural activities in the city. Warden was a trustee of the giant Standard Oil conglomerate and president of the St. Augustine Gas and Electric Company. The design of the castle was chosen to complement the Hotel Ponce de Leon and other resort buildings, which had been styled after classic Spanish architecture. In 1941, the castle was converted into a hotel and purchased by famed Florida author Marjorie Keenan Rawlings and her husband, Norton Baskin. Open in 1950, Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum was a mixture of the original auditoriums and a memorial to the life of the famous writer because, sadly, Ripley died at the age of 58, just before the museum opened. Today, the museum continues to display many of the items collected by Ripley himself, as well as many other odd, weird, disturbing, and shall I say spooky, objects from all over the world. Spooky Attraction Number 10, Fort Matanzas National Monument Fort Matanzas was built by the Spanish military in 1742. It sits on a spur of land called Rattlesnake Island near the Matanzas Inlet. The Matanzas Inlet connects the Matanzas River to the Atlantic Ocean and provides a water road directly north to St. Augustine. A Spanish engineer named Pedro Ruiz de Olano designed the fort. The fort was built by troops and convicts, as well as enslaved indigenous people and Africans. Long predating the construction of the fort, the area was named after a series of incidents that occurred in 1565. At that point, France was challenging Spain's hold on the Florida Peninsula. In 1564, France had established a settlement, Fort Caroline, near modern-day Jacksonville. This was a direct threat to the Spanish treasure fleets, and one that needed to be addressed. The Spanish Admiral Pedro Menendez de Avil founded St. Augustine in 1565 as Spain's response. French Captain Jean Ribot attempted to attack the new settlement by sea, but a hurricane wrecked his fleet and his forces had to march northward, splitting into two groups. Menendez and a small number of troops met Ribot's party at the inlet. The French surrendered, yet after surrendering, Menendez had nearly all of them slaughtered, with just eight surviving out of a company of 208. About a week later, the second contingent of French soldiers met up with the Spanish, and an additional 150 surrendered at this time, with all but 16 being murdered after surrender. Menendez chose to kill any of the French who weren't Catholic, and some 350 individuals were killed by sword and knife at what would become Matanzas Inlet, the Spanish word for slaughter. Around 180 years later, the Spanish knew that the city of St. Augustine was vulnerable from a southern attack by way of the Matanzas River, so the construction of a small fort was ordered. Like the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine, Fort Matanzas was built using coquina stone that was quarried in the area. One of Coquina's biggest qualities was that the stone, which was fairly soft, could actually absorb cannonballs. Balls fired into the thickly constructed walls would just bury themselves without splintering the stone. Spain retained possession of Fort Matanzas, as well as Florida, until 1763 when they turned it over to the British. Twenty years later they regained control, but at this point their presence in Florida was minimal. Eventually, in 1821, the U.S. took over Florida. However, Fort Matanzas was left to become a ruin. Today, the fort is part of the Fort Matanzas National Monument, which was created in 1924. The creation of the National Monument was the culmination of the U.S. Department of War's restoration of the fort, which began in 1916. The primary structure was shored up, 
Major cracks in the walls were repaired, and new construction, including wood roofs and steps, were completed. In 1966, Fort Matanzas was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. One of the best things to do while visiting the National Monument is to check out the shore of the river both north and south of the Visitor's Center's dock. There are hundreds of purple marsh crabs out there. These little animals are one of the most entertaining things to watch in this part of Florida. Their bodies are only about an inch or 25 millimeters wide and they are very active around the sand and rocks on the river's bank. Their range extends from Massachusetts all the way down to central Florida, so the Matanzas Inlet is near its southern limit. Looking closely at them, it's obvious why they're called purple marsh crabs. They're also called mangrove crabs since they commonly live among the mangroves, though the name mangrove crab can include many different species. Locally, the purple marsh crab is also referred to as ghost crabs, though the only true ghost crab in Florida is the Atlantic ghost crab, which is double its size and tan in color. In some cultures, crabs can represent the souls of humans, so perhaps they have the name ghost crab around the Matanzas Inlet, as they are associated with the long-ago murdered French soldiers. So that's about it. A curious collection of Florida's spookiest attractions and parks. Totaled up, they provided well over 400 years of enjoyment to their visitors while telling creepy tales and tragic history and sharing peculiar phenomena. Thank you once again for watching another of my videos. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.